call him Travis or Trav Play is the name I've gone for a while, but I'm Travis and uh, uh, I'm an author, I'm a YouTuber, um, and yeah, I mean, writing is really what I've been doing for since I was 12 years old. That's really where my, my main love is. Um, but I'm a YouTuber as well. I, I first started YouTubing with a gaming channel I called Trav Play, mostly focus on the video game called Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. A really fun video game. Um, but I've always been writing as well. I, I started out writing even before I did Trav Play, and I'm trying to transition more into just being an author and changing my channel to be more like that. Nice, cool. So, um,. What what are so, so you started out with the Smash Bros videos because that's how I found you was a funny story. Uh, the people in my family like to play Smash Bros, but I'm terrible at PvP games. So I was looking up like online tutorials for how to get better. And if I go like, I I would practice for like an hour a day just so I was able to beat my brother. And without practicing at all, I just don't win anymore. And you had a video called How to Beat Ness, which is your most viewed video. And then I noticed what when you updated, you're like, okay, I'm gonna be switching over to being an author because now I have a deal. So I'm gonna about to ask you like, how did that deal come into place? Because uh, a lot of people, most people I know, don't really read books, and so just the whole idea is weird. But uh, I went to school for business, so I was reading a lot of business books, and they never really went to history about how uh, they like got publishing deals and whatnot. So could you tell us a little bit about that? Like about the book industry and how that works. Yeah, like how did like, like all you know, that come together and like start? Okay. Well, so I guess the very beginning when I felt like maybe I could write something was all the way back in third grade. I just like a writing project that we did in third grade. I wrote a simple story about a dinosaur who gets lost and he finds his parents. And my third grade teacher read it to the class and she started to cry. Wow. And I was like, oh, oh. Maybe I can do this. That, when I that's was uh, 12 interesting because my parents are both teachers, and oh. like, I I wouldn't say they're easily moved, but sometimes they say, "Oh, I had this kid that said like this today," and it was like it rings true. So that is like more impactful to me too because I I get to see that up close like every day. Yeah, exactly. And I, I that was probably like the only thing that I did that my teacher liked. I don't know if I was a great kid, but. <laughs> The only thing. Apparently, I wrote a good story. I didn't think it was that good, but she, I was like, "Why is she crying?" I remember thinking, "Like, like, why is she crying? Like, is this a sad story?" But, uh, anyways, when I was 12 years old, when I was when I first started writing my first book, and it was the beginning of what I've currently have published. It's called Orion. Uh, it's a superhero novel, and I, I wrote like the first 40 pages, and then I went to my seventh grade English class and learned that I know nothing about English. <laughs> I was like, oh man, I'm no good at this. And I, I just, I couldn't bring myself to write anymore. And it wasn't until I got to college um, in the university that I went at, uh, there was a guy there named Br uh, Brandon Sanderson. I don't know if you recognize that name, but I'm not Brandon Sanderson. <laughs> Do you? No, I don't know that one. Oh, because uh, I went to GCC. So maybe that okay. has to do with it. Yeah, maybe. Well, uh, Brandon Sanderson, um, he is a super famous author. Just recently, he actually just like broke the record from Kickstarter to have like the most, like the hugest fund. Like he just said that he published four novels over the, the pandemic. And he's like, hey, I'm going to do four novels. If you fund my Kickstarter, it's just a million dollars. But they funded like $23 million for him. So he's, he's a really good <laughs> author. And so, he was teaching a creative writing class at my school. Does he and... talk about sci-fi? Oh yeah, sci oh, it's, okay. it's all sci-fi and fantasy. I've, it's I've, like all he teaches. I've definitely seen some of his lectures up uploaded on YouTube because I watched a couple of those. Because right now, like I've done all the editing skills for the videos I make, and now I'm like, okay, I have to get good at writing so I can keep people engaged and watching the video. So. That that's recently I've been exploring that, and then I found out okay, this Traveler is switching to an author. Now that's interesting. That's in this whole creator field. I want to hear what he has to say about all that stuff. And so, here we are. <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah, there's a lot of creator writing that goes into just writing a script for a YouTube video. Oh yeah. Uh, and I used a lot of that uh, with with all my scripts. 
Um, so, anyways, once I got into his class and he, and Brandon Sanderson started teaching, uh, one of, he taught a lot of great stuff. But one of the big things that he said is that like becoming an author, a successful author, is is really hard. It's really difficult to get into the industry, but it's not as hard as a lot of people make it sound. If you if you do the right things, if you practice and hone your skills, you can make it. And I was planning to be a, a pharmacist. Like I was already about like, to I'm enter going for the money. grad school. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't really care too much about it. I was just like, this would be like a good you know job, make yeah. money. But yeah, that's that's what I thought about business. It's like, well, I don't know what I want to do, so I might as well make a lot of money so I can retire early and then find out what I want to do for a living. Exactly. Yeah, that's, that's kind of what I was thinking too. But that class, I wish I had taken that class back when I was a freshman in college instead of when I was a senior, because then I would have changed my mind then. But this is all the way when I was about to finish school and I, I changed my mind. I changed my path. I was like, okay, I've known all my life that I want to write. I've just never actually decided to do it as my career. I always thought it just could never work. But now I've I've got some actual professional advice saying that it can work if you do it right. And so I was like, all right, I'm doing it. And it was on February 18th, 2016. I remember the date that I decided I'm going to be an author. Right. And um, so you've been working on the same book since then or have like you're like, I want to do this. And then you scrapped it after a year and did try something else. <laughs> so I've written like six books. Um, oh, OK. So so. Sorry. Yeah so, you, yeah, so you've done several. I, I guess I just overestimated how long it takes to write a book because whenever I hear like podcasts of this author and they're like, I've been writing this book for 12 years. And, and I'm just like, wow, I didn't know that that's how much effort it took. And it's like, okay, I guess maybe not. <laughs> it can, it can. Uh, there's some, it just kind of depends on the book. I mean, uh, Lord of the Rings took like 30 years for uh, Gerald Tolkien. So it can, that's just a book that has several languages and several worlds. It, it kind of depends. Right now, I've been working on a, a, another book that's been taking me about two to three years to do. It's just so hard. Some books are easy. They come fast. Some come hard. So it kind of depends. Yeah. Do you notice but, yeah. a distinction? Like this specific thing is harder than this? Does it have to do with genre, a specific character, or like something you want to focus on in the story that makes it harder for you? Uh, for me, it, it kind of has just to do with kind of more of the logical issues of the story like if if the plot just isn't coming together and i know that there's just some issues with it sometimes instead of just like sitting down and just trying to make it work i'll just work on something else instead yeah. like oh, i'll write that book that book sounds easier that that's a that's funny you say that because uh uh two of my fan base's favorite shows are she raw and the owl house and i like she raw a lot because the characters like the plot serves them they, they don't act out of character at all but two shows i have parodies owl house and bna it feels like the characters are forced to act a certain way so they can execute this plot and it it just feels so forced that it's it's like a massive turnoff from like an artistic standpoint and that sounds like for, for you doing that rather than trying to force it you're like okay let me let me take some time off and think how would these characters actually act in this situation then keep rolling that way yeah, that, that's actually a huge thing is, you know, make sure that characters are character driven and not plot driven, is how we say in the industry. Um, and it's not an easy thing to do because sometimes your characters just want to go away. That's going to go to like a terrible story. And it's like, OK, I've got to make it work <laughs> where yeah. I can make a good story <laughs> and still feel natural. Um, so anyways, yeah, I've been writing uh, since 2016, like seriously. Um, but then I was like, okay, writing doesn't make money right away. Uh, and I can't just suddenly be a writer and that be my job. I've got to find a way to provide because I already was married, already had a kid and we're you know, already planning on having a family grow. And so I was like, all right, I got to find a job to, to do while writing. And that's where I found, uh, some sales jobs. I, I did some some I sold windows. I went and knocked doors and sold windows. Ah, uh, I I, and, hate, I hate the 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 door to door salesman job because I uh, I tried to get in like the marketing, uh, so I just applied to every single marketing job that showed up on ZipRecruiter, and a lot of them are those sales jobs. And I'm like, 
well, I like focused on like digital marketing and whatnot. And they're like, oh, well, this is just face to face marketing. It's like, no, you're trying to make a conversion right there. My stuff is more like brand building. So it's funny. Yeah, I was that guy. I was that guy that did the zip recruiter stuff. That's like, no, this is what you want to do. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not doing that anymore. <laughs> Same boat. Yeah. Uh, do you do you have like a certain amount of time that you spend writing every single day? Like I've heard some people yeah. say like you should at least spend like three hours a day writing a day. And if you don't do that, then you might not reach conclusions because as you get in the zone, your idea formulation becomes better. But if you go beyond that, it's like you're burning yourself out. So do you have a yeah, set no, that's number? Actually, that's absolutely right. I, I actually try to not focus as much on the time as much as the word count. My goal is just to write like about a thousand words a day. And if I can do that, usually that's enough time to, to do that. Cause usually it takes about half an hour for me to even get back into the zone and then things start to really go. Yeah. Um, I find that interesting yeah. because uh, for myself, I always like, okay, I want to try to get all these tasks done today because how I make my video is doing the script and the editing and the voice acting. I have it all sequenced in like five days a week. I do these different things each day. But um, when I look at the task and I just see the time go by as I'm trying to do it, I get panicked like, oh, I'm not going to reach my deadline. The day's going to go by and I'm going to be like almost there, but not quite. And so I've found more solace in timing myself like, okay, I'm going to spend this much time doing this thing. And if I don't get it done, no sweat. I, I did my time and I'm going to go relax. So I found the opposite to be a lot more helpful to me because I just don't have the anxiety about trying to hit my word count anymore. <laughs> Yeah, that's funny. Like for me, that works for me with almost every other task with video editing, with with making YouTube videos and script as well. Like I'm, I'm thinking about time, but with writing, I don't know, I, I, I find a certain satisfaction of being like, OK, I actually wrote as much as I was hoping to write. Yeah. And, I, I... and not, not having to think about the time, because if I feel like I have a restrained, restricted amount of time, I get too stressed out about that. Yeah, I can see how it could help the writing because if you're supposed to write X amount of words, you can create a full cycle or a whole character loop that you want to demonstrate in like a page and you can get all the way through that versus like it might take you a while for a more difficult character that's been like stubborn throughout the whole journey. And so you have to spend more time thinking about that. But at the end of the day, if you still reach that thousand words, you'll be able to have gone through that versus if you just time yourself, you wouldn't have got there and then you'd be back at square one when you start the next day. Right. And when it takes so much to get into it too, it's like you need to have that good space of time. And it really, it, it's so lame when that time gets cut short. Like you're right an exciting part of the story and then yeah, it stops and you have to start all over. Yeah, <laughs> I think uh, I had a question later that said like, what are some of your older works that you use as stepping stones? And you said you already have a couple published yeah. books already. Could you tell us about those? What are what they're like focused on? Is there an overall uh, moral? Did you learn something from those experiences that you carried on to the next that like really help you make leaps and bounds? Yeah, with each book that I write, I learn a lot and I get better. So, like, before I wrote um, Orion, which is my first novel, I, I wrote a short story of, it's like a sci-fi that's totally unrelated. And it was only, like, 12,000 words, so that's, like, maybe, like, 50 pages or so. So it was a short, shorter story, but it was good for me just to get it out, just to finish something. Um, yeah. cause that's usually like the hardest thing for any author to accomplish is just to write something and finish it and finishing it is such a good feeling. It's like, all right, I finished a short story. Now I can finish a novel <laughs> and it helped. <laughs> that, that's a funny cause, uh, uh, I had the interview with another person who's in the same content niche as me, the abridgments. Uh, I asked him like, well, what's your favorite part of like this? He's like, when the video is finished and it's done and the physical products there. And I'm like. Yes and no, because my favorite part is like, okay, it is done. It's out of the way. I don't need to think about it anymore. And now I can do it all over again. That's interesting. Yeah, that's how I feel with most of the videos that I make for other people. Uh, but when it's my own art, that's, I, I don't know. I kind of just be like, 
this is my masterpiece. Take it. <laughs> oh, wait. I like to look at it. Yeah. Okay, enjoy. It's it. like, I want to make sure it's perfect. Yeah, it's like your, okay. mo your most recent work is always your favorite. But then once like you have a new one, you're like, this is now my baby. That one's grown. It's adult. It can go be its own. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so after my first novel and then my second novel, I, I learned a lot also with like how to publish them, with how to pitch them to agents and editors, the industry, everything there. It's crazy. But um, where I got into YouTube was when I was getting into the, the marketing world of, of writing books. Today is not the same as it was 20 years ago. 20 years ago, you you send your, 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 your book off to someone and they'll just have a slush pile and they'll read it and they'll say whether or not they'll they'll publish you with yeah. a big publisher but then ebooks came around and people can just purchase really simple books a lot of people can just read web novels for free online yeah there's with the right now it costs right very little to publish yeah it, it's it's like like i would say music was envious like a hundred years ago but nowadays literally anybody can make music so it's almost as if it brings the value of music down by oversaturation now that like anybody can write which uh, i had this question as well i'm going completely out of order right now but it was that's fine, uh, that's fine. uh writing as a medium like how has it like evolved because i still i still just have a little stack of books and more in my closet that like i read now and then if i want to learn or like be entertained but that is i'm still pretty much reading the same stuff that i was reading 10 years ago so i haven't kept up like i have friends and voice actors who like publish stuff on wattpad but i'm not in that sphere so i don't quite understand it or follow it so i'd ask you what how do have you seen that it's evolved over the past 10 years and how do you think it's going to keep evolving in like the next 10 years or so yeah just writing and that medium it's it's changed a lot like the ebook was really the big thing um i mean nowadays i think i know more people who listen to audiobooks than actually read physical books um especially like if if you know if they're in the self-help world or if it's all just that type of stuff they're just going to listen to something while they're running instead of taking the time to sit down and read um but the truth is that today there's still more readers today than there's ever been in the history of of mankind and that's yeah. just because there's more people and there's so much so much more stuff out there that's also interesting because uh back then when being like a published author was much more prestigious you had a lot less people who were literate and able to read even because we have like galileo and other people and it's like well only like the elites know how to read because everybody else is tilling tilling the fields and whatnot so now it's like uh, people say like oh kids aren't reading nowadays anymore but i feel like that might just be because kids are forced to read books in school and then when they get out of school they're like oh i don't have to read anymore now it's optional so it just becomes the people who would have read on their own anyways which is still much bigger an audience than it was so long ago so yeah well i i don't know i think kids still read a lot today it's just changed in what medium they're reading. They're not reading books as much, but they're, instead they're reading the dialogue in Pokemon Legends Arceus. <laughs> like whatever video game comes out. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, it's like, I do a lot of reading, reading text messages, that is. So I was like, yeah. what if like somebody made like a, a subscription plan where it's like every like so and so, like they would publish a story through text message because when you when you see something and you witness an event and you tell it to your friends over text message, you, you stick to the most important details and the most interesting details and you hype it up. So you cut out a lot of fluff, which is something that like amateur writers really struggle with, where they just get super nitty gritty details uh, describing the most like inconsequential things versus like a text message like it cuts all that out and gets right to the plot right to the characters right to the emotions so i was wondering like do you think like text message books could be like a way of the future <laughs> it's already it's already a thing it's called flash fiction flash and fiction like, oh that's cool so it has happened yeah like you can find it on twitter like tw you have twitter posts that are just stories like and they're size of a tweet <laughs> so yeah, there's there. That's not where I like to be. I liked I like longer stories, um, but there's there's a lot of that out there, and it's growing. So there might be more of that. Actually, I've seen a lot of interactive stories that like 
look like it's coming through a text feed. I was just playing a game like that today where you're like, it's like a mystery to solve and the whole time it's like a text message, but you, you have several options with how you can respond and the story yeah, well, changes. With your like if Clue was a book instead of a board game, which I think it already is a book, so that's why it's ironic. <laughs> okay, so yeah. um, <laughs> next one is, uh, oh yeah, what kind of videos or promotional content do you make to get like your name and your books out on the internet and heard more like do you have do you do ads or like the social media do you have an organic content strategy so uh i have a website and youtube travplay was actually my whole strategy to try and get my books out there <laughs> i was hoping that i would find I, I don't think it worked the way i intended it so that's like, why i'm trying to change things baited them in with video games and like okay now that i have people here now i can be like i actually do books <laughs> listen to this which, yeah which well, is like, really i actually funny. tried to do that the whole way through like sometimes in my script i would say and i'm a writer and i'm a writer some of you know i'm a writer and, and all my links i'd always have a link to my author website and my books but most people who watched my smash videos cared nothing about reading they just wanted to know how to beat ness or how to beat ganondorf or there's like i don't care about any of that so <laughs> i i've realized that like okay i need to shape my channel to get people who would like to read my books um but i'm trying to like juggle that it's 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 a tricky thing yeah um yeah so i've got several things across the internet to to promote like social media as well nice yeah because i know for me it's like YouTube is like what I want to do with my future and where I want to derive most of my income source. But I'll also take snippets from my parodies and put them on TikTok. And now it's like, okay, I have 10,000 followers on TikTok and like a hundred of those came over to, to YouTube. Probably a little bit more by now, maybe it's closer to 200 of them. But uh, it's, it's just one of those areas where I'm like, okay, like it's had me at the idea of like maybe I should just make TikTok videos instead, and I guess uh, what that would be most similar to you would be like oh is if I if I just kept doing Smash Bros instead of the writing stuff. But we're both like no, this is not what we set out to do. We set out to do this, make YouTube videos and write stories. So that's what we're gonna stick to. We're just gonna use these other things as like a lifeline just to help pull people into the main course. It's hard. It's really hard because what I found is that like. Especially with trap play, I've had this struggle where I've been like, my goal was to like get gamers to like my stuff, but also like to get in my reading and try and have both going. But the how to beat videos just started to grow and they grew <laughs> faster more than I thought. Like I had, I had a how to beat piranha plant was like the second how to beat video I made. And I, and I, I didn't touch my YouTube channel for like three months. I came back and it had like several thousand views and I was like, what? Like people like this? It, it, it's so weird oh, how yeah, that I'll happened that because uh, that happened to, with one of my other friends, Ween. He made a Doom Eternal challenge video and then he left for three months and when he came back he had several thousand, like, like 20 plus thousand subscribers or something ridiculous and he was just doing it for fun. He was, he's not like trying to take youtube seriously <laughs> which seems to be like a recurring theme like people who don't intend to make be successful at one thing suddenly do it's like that's not what they wanted so it's it's just very ironic um let's see yeah, it, it happens yeah how do you tell if a if a story idea is worth pursuing hmm. that's that. tough i've struggled with that one because I have a lot of other story ideas I'd like to pursue. Like my initial idea was just like, if it's just an idea that excites me, then I'll pursue it. But after I've done a, a lot of training and I've gone to a lot of writing courses and stuff, they, they give you a little more guidance. Um, so like, for example, I have this idea of a story that is about, it's a, it's a sci-fi sports story. Like underdog sports story. Uh, and... I'm thinking like like Battle Angel Alita's motorball sport. Do you yeah. know that movie? I can think of a, cool. I can think of some <laughs> movies. I can think of movies and video games that that would work. Like, but as I did my research, I couldn't find a single book under that category. Yeah, that That's seems weird because it's, sports. Yeah, like specifically about that because like there's a lot of sports anime now 
and I don't know how many of those existed before recently. It just feels like there was suddenly an interest in it. So maybe you're on that that forefront, and you're gonna be <laughs> the the novel version of Yuri on Ice or Haiku. Maybe, maybe I hope. Like the reason why I haven't done it is because you're usually when you write a story and you like send it off to agents and editors, they need to say, okay, what other books are like your book. If they were to go on a bookshelf in the library, what books would be around it? Yeah. And if you can't come up with other books to go around it, then your book may not be marketable. Yeah, that's interesting because I do that uh, for myself too. I think of a video idea. I'm like, okay, what other like videos and YouTubers is this adjacent to? Like, I'm working on this Halo Reach video. And I'm like, okay, there's Rocket Sloth who does Halo videos that are in like this this genre and another youtuber i think his name is like roken basso and they actually i one of them already did the same like video that i'm doing but i'm making it entirely comedy based and i'm like keeping like the the statistics to how it plays out to like a minimum i'm trying to keep it exclusively entertainment so if they're there for the challenge video because it's like playing halo without any guns then like they can follow along and see how i'm doing things i'll tell them but my main goal is just to entertain and make them laugh along the way right and that's a hard thing to balance too is like the entertainment plus information yeah. Like I had that challenge with my videos is that my, my videos are information, like how to beat someone, but I was trying to make it entertaining. What, what I found is I got a lot of really, uh, really competitive smash guys. who are just like getting down to the frame count of each thing. And they're like, no, you gotta be yeah. way more yeah. specific. And it's like, well, hold on. I'm just making this for people who are trying to get an elite smash. This is, this is not for professionals. Yeah. That so, because of, cause I have followed some of the elite smash people. It's like, I don't, care about the frame data just tell me when and what kind of situation i should use i'm not gonna know the frame stuff so your stuff was a lot more simple and easy to understand so i was able to watch yes, a couple that was of my back goal back. yeah because uh let's see the the telling if a story is worth pursuing for myself it's always been with the character um if there's a certain storyline that resonates with me personally i just think okay there has to be a deeper meaning to this or like a deeply philosophical thing then how could i really explore that further and have these characters tell the story instead of me like say it so that way they can portray it and get everybody else wrapped in their crazy rabbit hole and if it's relatable enough for me then maybe other people will get it too and i feel like that seemed to work like all the comments are like they're like ah the laughing at this joke or that or that reference or something weird where i put a plot twist in and they don't uh ever focus on the story so much but i put out a poll it's like hey are you watching my videos for the storyline or for the comedy and it was bulk storyline i'm like oh that's not even what i came in here trying to do in the first place but i'm glad because i've been trying really hard to put uh more story elements in Let's see. Uh, That's so, really cool. Yeah. What do you think is the most painful part of the writing process? This is probably going to um, vary person to person. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think. For me, I would say it's a couple things. One of those people things is, is probably the whole trying to get your writing out there like the the whole publishing process is pretty painful yeah, especially like the, like the distribution specifically or like the interpersonal dealing with people to make it happen sort of like business management part the, uh, yeah like yeah working with the people especially the agents who you need to like your book so that they'll like send your book to a publisher <laughs> and give you a lot of money for it yeah. And you send it to like 50 of them and you all you get is just a bunch of rejections. That's hard. <laughs> yeah. That's probably the most painful part. Yeah, and you're and they, already- they, yeah. advice. they just say, sorry, this isn't for me. And it's a form email with very, like only a couple of times to give you advice. I have some other agents that have gone on to read some of my book and give them some more advice, but the majority of it is just a bunch of, nope, not for me. So- And you kind of just left like, What's wrong? Do the agents have their own like specific niche? Like, oh, I'm an agent that specializes in romance comedies. If you make a romance comedy, send it to me and I'll take a look at it. And this person's like, I handle sci-fi. 
Is that a thing, or are they all like broad spectrum, or do they niche down? It's like, like that? that, but even more specific. Oh, like, so so like I'm writing a lot of my books for like middle grade is like 12 year olds, but also I have some young adult books. So I always I have to do a bunch of research on every agent that I look up, and I look up and I say, okay, they they always write down here's the kind of books that we like and don't like, and I have to go through like a hundred agents, pick out about. 12 that i think would like my book and then i sent it to them and like i i pitched one of my books in person to an agent that said that she liked middle grade science fiction and i was like great okay here's my middle grade science fiction book she's like yeah i'm sorry your book is a thousand years in the future i only do books that are just like maybe like one or two years in the future i'm uh -huh. like oh yeah dang it <laughs> so, so i can see how that's a part of like like a lot of people are like, I don't want to sell this show idea I have to Netflix or something because they're just going to tear it apart. And I can see how that is definitely prevalent in uh, the writing world now because they niche down so far. And they're like, I'm only going to send out a book that I like because this is like my area. And uh, crap, I forgot where I was going with that. Uh, yeah, it's a very subject, subject. Oh, sorry. It's a very subjective field. Like every agent, like you might have a great book. But if you just send it to 12 agents who don't like your style and you give up, you may have found you the 13th agent may have actually liked your style. Like it's it's yeah. a it's a just a big guessing game because it's just like what they like and don't like. It's not what's good and not what's not good. Yeah, uh, I remembered where I was going with that. Uh, so another YouTuber I follow, Fena, he's writing a book, but he's doing it self-published, so he doesn't have to worry about those issues at all. Because uh, he was told ever since he came up with his series Satellite City that's about these like alien creatures that are thousands and millions of years old, and they've just happened upon Earth and decided we're going to stay here, because we're, what else are we going to do with our immortal, immortal lives? And they're like, no, nobody's going to relate to this, nobody cares about it. So he went on to animate it, and, like, explosive, like, uh, he's like a quarter million subscribers, which is pretty small for YouTube, but that's enough to make more than a full time's living on YouTube. So he's definitely yeah. successful, and he had a live stream that happened today earlier. I got the notification. I was like, oh my gosh, he like never streams. And in the stream, uh, he said like he's in the final draft now. And then he went on to complain about uh, the people like you talking about who they're like, no, we can't distribute this. So um, the most that's unfortunate. And with him having that big of a following in YouTube, I would think that would help us help us cause. Yeah, they're often looking if you got a you got a following of, of some kind. Yeah, like there's definitely the financial backing part because like once a month or something there's like oh uh, character pins are back in the stock so like he makes money outside of AdSense and like who knows how much that's gonna be or like brand sponsorships because animations take a while to produce so I don't know what his workflow is right is like but if people are continually buying the pins they're continually selling out month to month to month. Of course he's gonna be able to sell his books i mean that's what he's been marketing on his channel since its inception he's just also animating elements from the story mm -hmm. that's cool and, and i've gone down the self-publishing route too so i have two books that are available on amazon nice. but i i don't do any animating so i'm not able to do yeah. <laughs> what your brother can do yeah um let's see uh, do you ever like because you said you usually write a thousand words a day what if you have like writer's block and you just like aren't feeling it do you still just like crap out a thousand words of whatever and then like flush it afterwards just to be in the habit of or do you like okay if i'm not if the ideas aren't coming to me i'm gonna take like a week off go on some hikes and listen to like pink floyd or whatever and then return the following how do you deal with that writer's block yeah i wish i would get a thousand words every single day <laughs> <It doesn't... laughs> even that's a struggle yeah, well, it's a struggle when you got a lot of life going on, too. Like, right now, I've got three kids. Two of them have special needs. And I've got a full-time job editing videos. So, and right now... And you're I'm... still able to put out YouTube videos and write. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm trying to, but it's it's not it's not easy. And, yeah, definitely not uh, easy, but, like, you're, you're still successfully doing all those things. Like, I can't imagine what more you have on your to-do list that you would like to get to, but just don't have the time to because you're doing all this other stuff at once. Right. 
Yeah. yeah, and that's that's why like any any donations my fans send or anything like that just helps a ton because it's like okay I can maybe devote a little bit more to this. Yeah. And um, so yeah, I've uh, yeah well, I I get writer's block. Like right now I'm having writer's block with that sequel I mentioned that's taking me like two or three years to write. And what helps me actually is not going out. Like I, I do like to go out and think about it. And sometimes I get really great ideas, and and that's great, but I never get around to actually putting it on paper. So what actually helps me to really get through it is just to sit down and hammer it out. That's like, uh, and I just have to really keep, relatable. Keep saying like, this is gross, this is terrible. I don't like it, but I'm just gonna write it anyways. <laughs> and once it's done, then I can have the satisfaction of going back and fixing it. And that's what kind of gets me through it. Yeah, uh, I don't have too much structure in my writing i tried doing that like recently with one parody that i did like a one shot of kagaster of an insect cage just to try it out and i think it turned out really well but um a lot of the times i'll get ideas when i'm just out and about and i have a a, a, a folder in my notes app that's just chock full of script ideas and things i want to do and elements that i want to add that I just never use, and I've had this going for more than a year, and I've only, like, I, I just never use it, unless I'm sitting there writing, and I'm like, oh, I remember this idea that I came up with, uh, however long ago, and I want to add it in, but I have this whole thing that I've never, like, sorted through it, I'm like, these are all ideas that I like, and I want to use, just never got around to them, but the, the, the telling, uh, the most, the most painful part of the process in breaking through the writer's block um, I can answer both those questions at once, mostly because one of them isn't really. Uh, the main struggle that I get is if, uh, because I already have a limited animations that I have to work with to, to shake them up and add twists, if I have animations that don't really mesh well with the story that I'm telling, or because, like, I, I, I can't watch any of my old works, so I'm like, oh, that's too cringy. So... I'm just generally, after I make something, it's like, you're, you're proud of it when it's your most recent thing, but as soon as it's not my most recent post, I'm, like, embarrassed of it and shamed to, like, claim ownership of it, which is funny whenever people are like, oh, I really liked it, because it's like, oh, I didn't just make this thing that's terrible. Uh, but I'll get to this point where, like, I really start to feel that, where I'm like, oh, this isn't good enough, this is terrible, why did I put this out, why did I start this in the first place? And then I know because people do like it and they expect more, so I just force myself to make more and it becomes like kind of formulaic and forced in a way and just loses the creativity until later, like like a month later or something, then I'll, I'll switch gears and then I'll get re-inspired. By... Right, you have to change it up a little bit. Yeah, but other than that, I usually don't really struggle coming up with ideas. It's more so, do I enjoy the process of doing the writing and the editing? And if I enjoy that, I, I always have ideas. Because I use this one example, because I want to do a parody of Hilda. And from what we know as the audience, uh, Hilda's mother is a single mom. So I want to make jokes about the dad off himself in the first episode. But the third season's still coming, so I'm like, if I make jokes like that and then he shows up in the end what am i gonna do is he gonna be like oh i just you you were so annoying i didn't want to have a kid so i faked my own death but there's a magical map and i need it right now or else the world is doomed and they're like well the house got stepped on by a giant the map doesn't exist and he's like no so whenever i throw a <laughs> wrench in like that that kind of stuff gets me going like is this a bad decision to do for the story that i'm gonna have to figure it out as i go I really like those. Those really excite me. I'm actually getting goosebumps talking about it. <laughs> so, um, I think that's so much fun. Like getting, yeah, getting those changes that you think that people are just going to be like, what? Like getting them excited over. Yeah. I think that's so much fun. Like that yeah. brings me so much joy. And, and that also brings up so much uh, like character backstory because that's going to change the way the mother behaves always and the kid too. It's like the kid can even like be bullied about it because like we've seen that before in other mediums and how that how that changes the way that people work because i even had a friend in high school who uh his mother died when he was young so he doesn't have any memories of her but if anybody made fun of him for it he got super serious and it's like oh i think 
he's about to like beat them up kind of stuff so i was like oh uh, to reflect that in writing uh is just feels really powerful yeah it does yeah so do you listen to audiobooks often i've listened to a couple mostly because the books that i do want as an audiobook there is no audio version of it that i'm like ah I wish I could just listen to it while I commute to work t for two hours a day. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in the last job I had, I did a lot more commuting, and so I listened to audiobooks a lot more. Recently, I've been working at home and with editing, and so I don't, I don't listen to it as often. But uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know if you've heard of Critical Role. They're like a Dungeon Dragons group. Critical and Role. Dungeon Dragons. Is basically... I've definitely yeah, heard they're... of them. I think I followed them you, at you one point. You mentioned voice acting. There are a bunch of voice actors who play Dungeons and Dragons. They have like their own little like custom cartoony avatars in the thumbnails, right? And they just they just came out with a TV show on Prime Video that's called Legends of Vox Machina. Oh, um, oh, that's them. I had no idea. Them. Okay, because I'm like critical yeah, role. I, cool. I feel like I've definitely seen them because uh, a lot of my friends in the the world that I'm in, a lot of people do the Dungeons and Dragons, and I tried to get into it in high school, but I wasn't able to. And it feels like the opportunity to comes up so much because like some of the people I'm collaborating with now talk about Dungeons and Dragons experience. And I was like, oh, I'm a draconic monk, and I'm like, what does that even mean? <laughs> Yeah. Oh, it's so much fun. And anyways, Critical Role, they're, they're one of the groups that I listen to a lot uh, while I'm doing stuff. Cause, so it's it's like an audio book. Yeah, I think they're the people who I followed because I was going to try to get into it. But I didn't understand what they were saying, so I just couldn't catch on. Because there's a lot of lingo yeah. that you need to learn. Just like like if you started playing Magic the Gathering, you got to know what tapped means. You have to know what canned is and all this other stuff. Yeah. So it's its Magic own language fun, but it's got a steep learning curve yeah absolutely i uh, uh spent like three days straight trying to like create like a six part structure to teaching somebody and i successfully was able to teach my sister it and like she caught on immediately i don't know if she's just a fast learner but i keep trying to get my dad because he sees how complex it is when me and my brother sit down and have an hour-long game and we have half our deck sprawl across the floor <laughs> <laughs> And so he's like, oh, that's a lot. That's going to be overwhelming. I'm like, no, Dad, I promise you, we're, we're, we're only going to have sorceries and creatures, creatures with <laughs> no abilities. So you don't even need to worry about that. All you need to worry about is mana consumption and attack phases. But uh, Yeah, I've, I've had that experience. So my younger brother, he has a YouTube channel that's just Magic the Gathering. He's called MTG Jeff. MTG and Jeff. Nice. he goes... He he mostly likes to do a bunch of janky decks and just kind of have fun with it. He's got a, a pretty good following. But whenever I play with him, like, I'm still just, like, reading the cards. Being like, like, like I get one? how the game works, and I, I like chess, and I like that it's, it's like, got that strategy with it. They all have their own personal abilities that changes the way the game works. Right, and I think it's fun. It's just, like, I don't have the... I just don't have the commitment to just read all those cards and learn it all. If yeah. I just had one deck and didn't have to worry about any other deck, yeah. I'm probably fine with that. <laughs> I uh, briefly, because before I did the channel that I'm doing now, I was doing a Magic the Gathering channel too, specifically around the Oathbreaker format, which came up like out of nowhere really, but hardly anybody was into the format, so I just stopped posting on it. Like, I only have 50 subscribers, I've made over 100 videos, mostly card analysis. But moving on from that, uh, so do you also do a lot of reading being an author? Like, read X amount a day? Because I try to read, but sometimes it's difficult to to start, which is why I have this stack right here that I haven't touched yet of things I still need to read. Yeah, I try to read as much as I can. I have a busy schedule, so I, I can as much as I'd like to. Well, which is the Stephen benefit of King. audiobooks. Yeah, I, I, I try to read more physical than audio, though, because... I can, every time I read a book, I'm analyzing it and learning from it so I can improve my own writing. Yeah. Um, Stephen King once said that if you don't have enough time to, to read, or then you don't have enough, then you won't have enough time to write and to write well. So it's like for writing, especially creative writing, like, like, like that, like novel writing, the reading is really important. So I, I read probably just like half an hour maybe to an hour at the most every night before I fall asleep in bed. 
Yeah, I just read on that's a interesting how you say you analyze it and we're about to take a break soon But before that I did the same where I would analyze because I watched uh, Rick and Morty uh, Because I feel like my comedy is very similar to theirs probably a little bit more intense than theirs though because I'm that, that that's just I like the extreme forms of comedy It's like it feels rare and so I appreciate it when it's executed really well So one thing I did was like I was like how often do does the camera angle cut? How long do they build up a punchline before they land a joke? How many jokes are in each episode and hyper analyzing the frequency so I could apply that to my own I did that for an entire season counting all that stuff just had like pages of data that like wow. I really applied because I was I was like I really want to learn from these I've literally uh the first four seasons of Rick and Morty I've seen them all 15 times all the way through and most of that was just because I was just analyzing it repeatedly 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 wondering how did it become so successful for its comedy and what I'm trying to take as much from that that's impressive yeah. While we're doing this intermission, uh, let me know in the comments if you have any Q&A, any questions you want me to answer or Travis to answer, and he'll probably can make a social media post about that. Or let me know if there's any particular guests you'd like to have me on in the future, because I have a growing roster right now, and I'm just waiting until I get a couple episodes done just to reach out and grab some more people. All right, thank you, and back to the interview. You probably catch us with videos because you have to like cut out dead space when people are talking. And yeah. I try to do this where if there's like a gap, that's where it's like, okay, I can add on here as long as it doesn't like interrupt the flow of conversation. And that moment where I was like, wait, what was I talking about? And then like you started talking immediately afterward. I was like, I think he caught that and like did that on purpose. So there was no dead space. Did you do that on purpose yes. or was that? Okay, I was like- No, I did that on purpose. Okay, yeah, yeah. I, I was like, that feels like that was intentional and you caught that, which I'm like, cool. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like in a normal conversation, dead dead space, it should it's totally fine. But like when this is like a video, like dead space is what makes people move away to a different video. And yeah. so you just gotta yeah. like gotta keep it coming. <laughs> yeah. Uh I noticed something weird because I also uh track like the dips in my audience retention. And I have seen that where if there's not an intentional moment of silence, people will also click away. Or like if you mispronounce or stutter, people have left. Like that's been a moment where like people like drop, like five percent right. of viewers go away because you stuttered. And I'm like, oh, I need to be careful not to stutter. And that happened yeah. in the Halo video, uh, but of course with only thirty people, that probably was only like two people. But I was like, that's still two people who could have been continued to be entertained just because I stuttered. But uh. Yeah, I worked hard on my videos to take out a lot of stuttering because I stutter a lot. I would read the script and I just had to do it over and over until I got it right. And then we just get like the perfect cut all together yeah. with the audio first. Yeah, I don't try to cut out a lot of the talk shows. Like I'll cut out like the beginning and the middle, like right now. I think right now I have it recording. Okay, yeah, yeah I just need to turn my mic off. And now we're good to resume. So the next one is, uh, what are your favorite books and authors? I'm pretty sure one of those is J.K. Rowling because you just recently had a video about that. And my follow-up question also has a question about your thoughts on her. So, uh, your favorite books and authors. Yeah, so J.K. Rowling, Harry Potter was the first book as a kid that I like didn't want to go to bed. I was like, I would rather stay up and read this, like, all night long. I think I um, had that with uh, The Alchemist, the Nicholas Flamel series. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one, too. Because um, I've read a lot as a kid, but that was the first one that I was like, wow, I really like this. Uh, since then, as I've gotten older, I've come to, I really like Brandon Sanderson. I like his books. Um, there's, there's a lot of other good back books out there, not really coming to mind, but those are, like, the main... Yeah, the main two that I follow. Oh, I also really like R.L. Salvatore. He he writes uh, Dungeons & Dragons books, apparently. I, oh. I read them as a kid, and I had no idea they were related to Dungeons & Dragons at all. You're I like, I was crazy. learning all about Dungeons & Dragons, and I didn't even know it was a game. <laughs> exactly, yeah. I didn't even know that it connected to it. So now that I, I love Dungeons & Dragons and I'm playing it a lot, those books now mean a lot more to me. So, yeah, yeah a lot of fantasy, sci-fi books 
Have you read any of the Game of Thrones books? I have not. Because I know I um, my grandma actually read the Game of Thrones books and she really liked them. So my sister started introduce her to the show and she's watching it even with all all of the the inherent issues that go on with it that may be displeasing to some people but uh aside from that game of thrones the hobbit lord of the rings harry potter are like some of the biggest and most well-known books and so this question is what do you think made those books so famous and subsequently jk rowling and stephen king so famous what about that what was that like extra spice that made them so explosively successful compared to the others because for um jr tolkien because you said it took him like 30 years and then he finally released this book and that could be seen as like that was just the ultimate experience that all of his experience culminated to but other than that i don't know too much as for jk rowling or stephen king's backstories because didn't they start when they were a lot younger jk rowling like harry potter was her very first book so like her success was like a, a, an extreme outlier like it was yeah, that's, that's unheard different. of like the first yeah, book to like be that successful. almost like a literal overnight success because yeah. that was number one. Of course, it did it take a while for it to gain traction, or did it pop? It still took a little while. Uh, like the second book gained a lot more traction. Like I didn't, I didn't read Harry Potter until the fourth fourth book was already out. So it, it took a little bit, but it was still much faster than most first books, like debut authors. Yeah, yeah. So to answer your question though, about like what was it that made? <laughs> those authors like successful i think the actual answer is that i i don't think anyone really knows like i think we can actually we can speculate and theorize all we want but when i talk to like agents and the people who are in the the book industry and they're trying to find a book that they think will be successful they often find that what they think is going to be good actually isn't and the book that takes off often is unexpected that it takes off so there's a lot of things I, I think that good books do well but i think there's a lot of amazing books out there that are written that ha like no one reads just because something went wrong something along the line didn't work out like like for example uh moby dick moby dick is a, a huge classic but that author when he tried to publish it it failed and it flopped horribly yeah, and wasn't there this one died of failure? Wasn't there this one author who like he spent a ton of his life working on this one book and then he published it and then he died and then like a couple years after he died, like not even like a decade, just a couple years, then it exploded in popularity, but he had already died so he couldn't see the world change because of his book. I don't know who it was, but I think that was a, a story that I heard uh, yeah, recently. It, there's several examples like that. Moby Dick is one of them. And maybe, so maybe it was like, that one because uh, Moby Dick was written how many years ago? I want to say almost 100. Oh, okay, I was, I was going to say 200, but I was like, maybe that's too far stretched. That doesn't sound real, but that makes more sense because I, I think that's that is the one that I was thinking about. But um, oh, I had a, I had a point from earlier because uh, you said about the not knowing what books would explode. A lot of that business knowledge comes from tracking what's going on in the sphere at once. But what they can't track is things they don't know. So if they don't know there's a thirst for a certain kind of book or novel, they can't say that it's going to explode. But because there's that thirst that people don't know about, like I had this weird idea, like, oh, if I ever went onto an alien spaceship and I smelt like them cooking food and it was a smell that I have never smelled before, what would I think of it? Would I find it repulsive or would I be like, this is so amazing, bring this to Earth, it needs to be here, or would I not even notice it because it's so foreign to me? I was like, maybe books are like that, where people have never smelled it before, and so nobody's aware that they would like this smell until they do. And then after it comes out, is like, well, it's pretty obvious. Maybe that's the issue why, and that's why it's important to be at the forefront and always being tr trying to do something new or different. Because that's one thing they say in the YouTube, too, is like try to be different from everybody else. Like it's okay to start off emulating anybody because that's how everybody starts off in all sorts of life. Animals do that too, until you find your own voice. And I hear voice is very important 
part of the writing. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And I, I think that um, that's, <laughs> excuse me, it's hard because a lot of people try to analyze and really try to guess what people really like and what will explode. Um, but because it's, uh, so you'll find some agents who like really just focus a lot on the analytics and they're like, no, this has to be in the parameters of success and that's the only thing I'll be in. This but be you, usually exactly those are the less successful pages. agents. The yeah. more successful agents are more just like, no, I'm just looking for a good book that I like and that I'm and then I'm passionate about and I can sell that to a publisher. So still subjective like that. Uh, I believe you said this might have been in the, the first chapter video of the Sorcerer's Stone. You said that the prologue for Harry Potter was went through 17 revisions or am, did I hear that number from somewhere else? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard that from Brandon Sanderson. Okay, so class. 17, like, versions of it. Like, how do you approach the different versions? Because in English class, basically what I would do is I'd write my draft, and then it's like, well, why do I need to write the final draft? Am I just going to write it out all over again? I don't understand what's wrong with the draft, because I'm not being educated on how to become a better writer. So I would just turn... Uh, literally like rewrite it word for word basically just a little bit neater maybe slightly tidier punctuation and not until now as i'm writing so many youtube scripts i'm like oh the only like real difference i see between like the rough draft and the final draft is like okay this sentence it sounds weird when you say it out loud so let's change it up to have some more natural language or maybe this paragraph to this paragraph it's just you're talking about one thing and now you're talking about a completely different thing so you need some word or something in that last sentence so you can then tie it into there so it flows more naturally which is comes to a conversational tactic where some people if they don't like have a specific thing that they want to carry off of it's like something you said in your last sentence before you stop talking take something that out of that sentence that's unrelated to the conversation at hand and continuing off of that and people won't even notice because it's not an abrupt change it's just it's that one tiny bit of a puzzle like most of a puzzle is all these square pictures it's just the little rough edges that make it all seamlessly connect together and that's really what i felt like was the difference between the draft and like the final version was just making those connections and cleaning up the picture a little bit so it's easier to see yeah yeah like a revision can you know it starts out with big changes and gets to small changes so like right now i'm working on a book that's my eighth revision so i start out first first draft is awful like i just write it just to get it down my second draft i almost kind of like rewrite the whole thing i go through and make a lot of changes yeah make it Third so draft it is a little flows. more a little more fine-tuned and and as you go it just gets a little more smaller and smaller and smaller but you also as a writer you need to send your book to other eyes for other people to see you need to have alpha readers and beta readers these are people who yeah, i've read heard about that feedback. i've just never understood like oh do people get like paid to just like read books for people and give feedback like this as a job that just sounds so foreign and weird like video game testers it's like oh i get to play video games for a living it's like that's a real job is it but now nah, it's like you're confirming that that is real and it's not like oh only the elites get it but it seems more like whoever's like able to and willing to do it and has like the credentials like just enough to do so like um a lot of like people in my community in my youtube community i'll show them a thumbnail or a video idea and sometimes what they say i follow through on it and it's wrong and i'm like what i and i revert back to what i thought was better but i was just like looking for their judgment but like occasionally like there's a little bit of advice that like really rings true i'm like oh i should have caught this myself but it took somebody else seeing it for me to realize that there was a mistake going on there so it switches yeah, why it's really hard to see all the stuff that's your own and i don't really i don't pay anyone to to critique my work unless it's like a professional editor but uh all the beta readers those are just usually other authors okay. that i have a community with usually on a website and we critique each other's books 
So yeah. there's, there's just a community of authors trying to make our work better. Yeah. And do you guys all have like specific writing structure that you usually follow when writing your books? Or is it much more free flow like for me? Uh, I've only recently been experimenting with story structure. Before that, I would just see like, okay, I have this clip. I want to make them say this. And now they have this click, clip. Uh, how can I connect that to what was just said? Okay, then they say it. And I just go off the top like that. And I don't really change it up that much just because like the improv snappy comedy is like, like what I, what I pay attention to. So I'm like, I usually go off right. that. Even though I could see like going through it a few times, like the, the sentence sounds weird, I change it. But that's how I go from like my draft to what makes the final cut. But you have like an outline of, of what it's going to be, right? I have like a summary for what happens in the episode. Like, oh, here they go to uh, they go up north and in the snow and they're digging for uh, first one's artifacts and they are tracked over there because in the previous episode Scorpia gave up their location and so they're going to ambush them while they have the opportunity and while they're vulnerable. Unfortunately, one of uh, the bad people who is like, like while she's an antagonist, she's also antagonistic to the other bad guys. They're like not working together. She's pretending to get along with them. So she's like, okay, I'm gonna try to kill them while we're alone together. And then these other people show up thinking the same thing and then they get in the way of each other's plans. So I'm like, okay, that's the plot. And then I just write what the characters say. Gotcha. Yeah, like, yeah. when it comes to like having the, the, the actual format, there's there's not one right way um there's certain like there's certain ways where it's like you can have like a three act structure or you can have a a, a beat point structure or you could just be just free flow so there's <laughs> there's really just all the different kinds <clears throat> yeah is there one that you see like more prevalent than others uh because when i watch the writing stuff because I tried following the hero's 12 step, but a lot of the steps seem very unnecessary or hard to apply to some parts, yeah. which is why like Dan Harmon does it in eight because he thinks that four of the steps are completely unnecessary. So he does it that way. But um, for I think when uh, I did the Cagster of an Insect Cage parody, I followed the three act structure. So in like the first third, I was like, okay, I'm gonna set up the world so people understand what's going on, they get introduced to the characters, and they introduce the plot. And then uh, the middle part is just them being entertaining and being themselves and getting into side plots. And then the th third part, okay, now everything's resolved. It could have resolved really quick, but I just dragged it out just to follow the three-act structure, which I thought was weird because I could have ended it in Act 2 if I really wanted because the main conflict was something really small. It was just the characters being like not listening to each other and being mean to each other. It's like, you just need one character to say, hey, so what's actually going on? And then they explain and then it's like, okay, it all makes sense. But I was able to have them separate themselves and then have like plot uh, B, C, and D go by. And then I come back to plot A and resolve it at the end. So uh, do, you, do you see like, the, is the three act structure more prevalent? Cause I know in uh, like, Bojack Horseman and Rick and Morty, I think they follow much more beat structure. So that's where I'm seeing it. But is there one that you see a lot more common than others? It's the beat structure. So okay. it's uh, comes from a book called Save the Cat. It's a screenwriting book and it has it, it has a pretty it's I forgot how many numbers it is, but it's just a beat structure. Just like this is when the inciting event should happen. And here's the next part. And then here's like the climax. And here's the next part. So yeah, it's called Save the Cat, and there's different versions of it. There's one for writers, for novel, for novelists. Uh, but yeah, yeah, you probably like the one for screenwriting. It's that's the most popular among writers today. Yeah, and is there any writing tactics that you use specifically that, uh, as far as you know from other authors, that most people don't utilize? Like for me myself, I find a lot of people in the abridgment niche that I do, they'll watch the episodes that they're parroting like as they write the script i don't whatsoever i just cut up the visuals and i see okay i see them doing this and i just assign my own reason for them doing it which apparently the other people uh they usually they pay more attention to what they're talking about 
and what they're saying and responding to situations. So I'm, I, I'm just like, oh, I don't know how you would even do that. Because I did that for my first couple of episodes only, then I stuck to the visual exclusively just because I found it easier to uh, go back and forth between my timeline and uh, Google document. Just as an example of something that I do that's different from the people I know. Do you have anything that you know to be more unique than your fellow authors? Let's say first off, the stories themselves <clears throat> are, are, I try to make them unique in their own way. Um, but also, <clears throat> the way that I write it, every character kind of has a different voice. So in every book, I do something unique that will make like the main character a little quirky or <clears throat> the villain to be a little different. So I don't know, it's different in a lot of ways. I don't think I can say there's just one way like maybe the one thing that I do that I write differently than most writers is that I use the dot 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 a lot. I like to have a lot of pauses in my writing to give emphasis. And I've had some editors go through and they're like, you do this a lot. I'm like, yeah, I do, don't I? I like it. I don't want it to stop. You should so, literally spell out dot 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 <laughs> once. Yeah, dot dot dot. And then I, I just realized I went back and read Harry Potter and I really realized J.K. Rowling does that a ton. Like she does a lot of the dot dot dot. So I was like, like, oh, oh that's good where I'd get it I from. I picked that up. Yeah, that, that happens a lot. Like in, in YouTube too. Um, let's see. Uh, I think I have a couple left because I asked uh, the last question I asked was what made like Stephen King and J.K. Rowling so successful and i said i think it might just be because that wasn't on anybody's radar so there was no way to track it and because it was fresh and new which is why people say keep trying new things and then we had the writing methods and how do you personally continue to grow your writing abilities to make sure each novel is better than the last one will you have more uh, like tools at your disposal when it comes to writing out the characters and whatnot yeah, I think that comes through education and practice. Uh, it's good for me to have my a writer's group where I'm re I'm reading a lot of their books and I critique them and I analyze what they're doing. And that also helps me to think, okay, I've learned that from them. Maybe I can change mine up a little bit better that way too. Um, so I get a lot of ideas just from reading a lot of other awesome writers out there. Um, so that's and practicing that as well as what I can do into writing my next book and making it better. Yes, yeah. And, and the way I do that is I watch like other com comedies that are like successful or inspiring, like American Dad, so wildly successful. I should really do a deep dive into that because I've watched those ones a couple times too. But like the Rick and Morty, how I would deeply analyze it, that's one way that I was growing. And then uh, one of my friends does some very family friendly jokes. And I was like, I don't want to get stuck in a road where I can only make inappropriate jokes because then there would be no YouTube success long term in that regard. So I was like, OK, I'm going to make a series that is as clean jokes as I can. No swearing whatsoever. So that way somebody could watch it with their kids. Uh, yeah. and, and so I started to watch some like made for children shows. Hilda is one of them. And the jokes that they come up with, I'm like, what categories does this come up with? Like there's, I have like, I would have a, a paper with these are 12 different forms of humor. And I would put a tally mark every single time I would catch one. And I'd see like, okay, they focus a lot on irony or sarcasm instead of like dark humor. <laughs> So that, that, that's one way that I've been growing as of lately in that. Let's see. Um, above all, what do you think is most important in writing stories? I think it's most important that you actually really enjoy it and that you, you're loving it, what you're doing. And that it's not only for you, but, you know, for the readers or the viewers that, you know, you're giving them, you know, some joy in some way. I think that really is what makes it worthwhile. Yeah, I can see that because like having gone through phases where like I would hate writing my scripts and then like just like force it through and then it's like, uh, that, that makes it kind of bad. Like, am I going to look at this in a year from now and be like, I shouldn't have done that. Probably. I look at back at it like like a month ago. I shouldn't have done that. Well, it came out a month ago. I made it three months ago, but tomato potato. So. 
Yeah, uh, let's see, what, other than that, above all, what do you think is most important in the writing of stories? I think engagement is really good, because my dad was talking about how he read Dune, and they went in so much fine detail about the stuff, and this is a lot of, like, amateur writers on, like, Wattpad and whatnot get so much into the, the details of the physical world that the character's in. But it's like, I just want to imagine what I want. If I want to imagine some, like, colorful rainbow trees, let me do that, because unless your story depends on that, it, it's perfectly fine. I want to hear about the characters and relate to them and understand them and hear the things they're going through and have it go through more quickly. So I've always uh, thought about, like, the reader engaging with it, but that might be a little bit biased because being focused on YouTube videos, it's like, well, I can't get views and reach more people if I'm not constantly trying to keep the reader engaged. But um, uh, what would you say to convince somebody to start reading again? Because they, everybody was reading in school and then they stopped afterward. And there's some people who say, like, I would love to start reading again, but I just don't have time. And maybe they just need that little bit more encouragement and then they'll pick that book up that they have on themselves and continue reading it. <laughs> Yeah, first I would say, yeah, you do. You have time. It's just that you're spending that watching Netflix instead of reading a book. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I mean, you're doing all the things that you talked about, and then you even talked about how you read other people's stuff, too. And I joked earlier about you even having another laundry list of things that, like, you're paranoid about, like, not getting to, and you're, like, reading other people's works as part of that. And I, I, I agree with that. Um, yeah, you know, it's even hard for me, like, even even as, as, you know, as a writer who's, like, supposed to read a lot, it's still even hard. Uh, so I, I, I get it. I get the, the whole, like, I don't have time to read. I say it some, a lot, too. But really, like... It's like, show me your phone. We probably do. We probably could, like, it's just that we'd rather sit down and watch, like, TikTok that just immediately grabs our attention instead of having to work and use our eyeballs and our our mind to actually like try to understand words and stuff yeah like, it's like gotta stretch that muscle <laughs> it, yeah it, it's I, I, it's I like say, going to the gym to, to do it like just because like i think yeah you're gonna go ahead and watch your movies and stuff but there's something special about like even having a physical book where you have to turn pages that uh I don't know, it, 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 it reaches a different part of the brain that really feels like you're learning than just kind of going brain dead in front of a show. Yeah, one thing that I know is like reading off of a screen. I never really liked digital books and I realized why the other day was, um, so I was reading and I came across this word that I didn't know. So I got super close to it to like see it right next to my eye. I'm like, I couldn't do that on a screen without like getting way up there and that'd probably not be good for my eyes. And I was like, I like the fact that if like something is too small, I can just hold it closer to my face. Like, monitor. What I'm gonna do? I'm gonna move my whole head. That that's more difficult. You just strain your neck. But um, other than that, I think it's definitely way more of like a mental exercise because when you watch like TikTok and whatnot, like a lot of people they try to make you think about concepts that they feel are important. But the whole part about reading is you're thinking the entire time. You're, you're following along and understanding and comprehending, which when it comes to TikTok, a visual medium, and people are like spewing it, your brain doesn't have to work hard at all because all that imagery is going in. And if you're not getting enough of that imagery, then you're like, okay, scroll to the next one until I can kind of shut off and just, you know, empty calories versus reading is like, you have to do that. You have to create that mental image. You have to apply yourself to understand. And that that's just like a brain workout. It's just the same as like going to the gym and eating healthy. It's like if, if you want like a healthy mind or a well-developed vocabulary, then like do those things. Or you, you want to get ripped, then go to the gym. It's like we, we know what we know what to do. But writing has been so far removed from the culture. I feel people don't talk about how good of a mental exercise it is. I don't remember uh, if it was in high school or college that I would like wake up and I would read something just to get my mind going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I uh, think that there's something magical about the reading medium compared to TV or anything visual. Yeah, because like when I mentioned like the Hogwarts Express, there's an image that's going to come to your mind, and it's likely going to be the train that you saw in the movie. And it's like, okay, there's there's a train. 
But when you're reading Harry Potter before the movie comes out and you just read it, it's different. You have to imagine what this train looks like. And you're trying to imagine that. And the author tried to describe it in a way that will like try to paint a picture of what, you know, JK Rowling imagined. And it's like you're having this kind of connection with the author of like you're both trying to imagine something. She's trying to put it into words and you're making making your own picture of it. To me, like I think it's I think it's a magical thing that only happens through the process of storytelling, that, uh, through that, writing. That's also like, because um, she has an idea and she's connoting it, and you're interpreting it in a certain way. But and if somebody else interprets it differently, like, uh, have you seen Steven's Universe? No. Okay. Uh, there's this episode where the two main characters there are like fanboy and fangirling over the series which was like their universe is harry potter and they talk about how they interpreted the endings differently and because of their different ways of interpreting it like they interpreted this scenario differently like it connoted this or they, they thought it connoted this and that made them have opposite perspectives of the experience and the whole episode the moral of that episode was like you should be able to like speak your opinion to your friends like fine like if 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 they're not your friends they aren't going to respect it but if they are your friends they're going to respect your opinion and listen to it uh, that was the moral of the story but once they were able to like get that in the open and start talking about it, they were able to bond even more deeply because they were seeing it through the other person's eyes and understanding it in a way they'd never understood before which i believe is a area where video and like audio can lack uh, it, because it, takes it, away. it, 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 it takes that it, away it, from it, you. It kills that. Yeah. Like, for example, with, with Harry Potter, I used to call, I used to say the word uh, uh, Hermione. I used to call the character <laughs> Hermione. And my brother used to call her Hermione. And we would like, <laughs> argue all the time that it's like, no, it's, it's Hermione. No, it's Hermione. But then when the movie came out and it was Hermione, you we were both like, wrong. Oh, I didn't see that coming at all. And. But then it was established, and we, we no longer could have that fun argument. <laughs> it's now it's a fun memory. Yeah. So what? Um, you're you said you're on the final draft of the book you're working on right now. The book I'm working on. Well, I'm working on several books at the same time. Gotcha, gotcha. Like, I'm on the final draft of two books. Like, I'm making like the eighth revision of one of my books. I'm trying to write, I'm still trying to finish the first draft of the, the sequel to the book I have on, on Amazon. So, got like three drafts that I'm actually working on. Nice, gotcha. Well, my, my key light died, so that's why it got dark all of a sudden. But uh, this is Travis Scott, author. And I'll be linking uh, your, do you want uh, the one where you talked about Harry Potter? Because I thought that was pretty well put together. And I really like the one where you talked about the story for Zelda Breath of the Wilds. Because um, uh, I thought that was a different take because most people talk about how like, oh, it's the open world or there's so many different gameplay mechanics. It's like Minecraft Zelda, but you brought up the storyline and how like it's even optional so people can have it if they want it or they can skip it if they don't want it and that gave uh, uh players more freedom to enjoy it as they would like to which probably helped its its brand because that's one issue i have with pokemon games is you can't skip the cutscenes. it's like oh, I've, I've seen this a million times i'm just mashing the button like doom eternal you can't you can skip every cutscene. and i was like why, why can't pokemon do this but it's like you say that that like my that. next video is about pokemon I'll have to link that one. <laughs> Maybe they'll, uh, yeah, the yours will probably be done before this is. <laughs> I, I, I already finished it like two weeks ago, so. Oh, but it's awesome. Nice. Well, Travis Scott, thank you for coming on and sharing writing stuff. And it was cool to hear more about uh, the writing world because um, I didn't think about like careers seriously until eighth grade. And I was like, author would be cool. And then I started planning out like this fantasy novel and then i was like oh maybe i'm not the best writer but now i'm to the point where i'm like oh i didn't think that would ever happen why i would start writing but in video format instead and just seeing all the stuff that actually goes into it and gaining a deeper appreciation for all the stuff that goes into writing the books and how many revisions it goes through and how authors think as they write the book too 
because that that's one thing I've always liked because for doing YouTube and studying YouTube whenever I watch any YouTube YouTube video even if it's somebody that I watch just for fun I'm like analyzing it okay this is their intro they're trying to fit in so many words when does the intro end and the video start like I'm analyzing it everything like that even when it comes to Rick and Morty I still watch it for fun but I'm analyzing every step of the way and I've never had that pleasure when it comes to reading but now I can understand a little bit better about like uh, the cycles for like okay they're trying to establish this in this paragraph and whatnot yeah. and build up here so that's cool thank you for coming on yeah and I'm Maybe we'll be able to meet sometime and have coffee or something because we're both in Arizona. <laughs> it's yeah. it's in the realm of possibility because uh, I mean, we're still like hours away. Arizona is a lot bigger than most people think. Yeah, I, I mean, I drove to California like every weekend, like five hours either way for work once. So it's like. And then driving all around for work right now, it's like, eh, I had driving's whatever. I mean, except for gas right now. That, that would, biggest issue right there. Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> expensive. Yeah, and like all all throughout the off the offer, like, uh, well, how much do you usually write at once when you like uh, give your your drafts out for people like the beta readers and whatnot? Um, for my writing group, I just do like one chapter at a time. But if it's like a beta reader just for a friend, I'll give the whole draft. Now, how it, how long? Like, how long are those usually? Like um, pages. Words. I'm writing like books for younger audiences, okay. so oh, right so now I'm right, not in your audience, <laughs> right? <laughs> I, yeah, so I'm not writing anything for like adults, but if you're like I don't know if yeah, like if you're okay with like teenage stuff, right now it's yeah. like I, I mean I did say I'm looking to ex expand more into the kid friendly genre and understand that, so maybe this is also gonna help me out too. <laughs> Yeah, I could send you one that it's, it, uh, I'm making it for, it, it probably is about, it's it's a little bit shorter than a Harry Potter book, like the first Harry Potter book. Gotcha. So that was like, well, the first book was like 280 pages, so this is probably like 200 pages, 220 pages. Okay, yeah, another YouTuber that I have, uh, follow and made an intro for, Proto Mario, uh, he just recently put out uh, his own book that he authored. I think it was like something close to 100 pages, and... I once uh, volunteered, I was like, hey, if you want like me to do an audio version of this, I could. But then I was like, I got busy with my new job because that started re like right afterward. And I was like, oh, I can't do this now. <laughs> uh, do you have people doing uh, the audio books for the books that you've already written? Or uh, is that no. something you have coming or ever planned to do? I, I would like to like my self-published novels. I have thought a lot about it. But my self-published novels haven't really been successful enough for me to want to pay for it because, or make the time for it. Like I'm kind of waiting until I get a book that's like traditionally published with a big publisher with like a huge launch. And I would like to have an audiobook. Like if you get it with a big publisher, they'll make the audiobook for you. So that's, that's kind of what I'm looking for. That's a benefit. So, yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you for your time. And. Have a lovely ev evening. Good good luck with the continuing the writing. I, I'm not ever sure how to close out these things. Usually, I, I try to get more fancy with the end screens as of lately. But I think for the last one, I just threw up an image, put uh, the next videos, and called it a day. <laughs> I, oh, I'll just say thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for coming on.